a second object shot down. This time, President Biden ordering troops to ground it over Alaska. The Pentagon saying it posed a threat to civilian aircraft. Meanwhile, Biden says the Chinese spy balloon from last week did not pose a major breach. That's as the FBI sifts through the recovered debris. Questions are swirling around China's refusal to pick up the phone. Past instances of balloons spotted over the U.S. coming to light. And what this all means for the world's two biggest superpowers going forward. What do you think? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Another flying object grounded. The U.S. military today took down an object flying over Alaska, prompting questions about who's behind it this time. NTD's Iris Tao brings us the latest from the White House. The object shot down over Alaska, Mr. President. Less than a week after the Pentagon shot down a Chinese spy balloon, the U.S. military grounded another flying object over Alaska. The object was flying at an altitude of uh, 40,000 feet and posed a reasonable threat to the safety of civilian flight. Out of an abundance of caution and at the recommendation of the Pentagon, President Biden ordered the military to down the object. The White House says the object was discovered on Thursday night and President Biden ordered to shoot it down Friday morning. The White House adds they are expected to recover its debris as it landed in U.S. waters. But the biggest questions, including who sent this one over and if it's again for spying, are yet to be answered. We don't know if it's state-owned um, and we don't uh, understand the full purpose. We're calling this an object because that's the best description we have right now. The few details we do know so far include the fact that the object was the size of a small car and was confirmed to be unmanned before it was taken down. The Pentagon wouldn't get more specific in its Friday briefing. Look, there are going to be times when there's activities happening that we're monitoring that we're, we're not going to go public, especially if it doesn't present a particular or pose a significant threat. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. More on the Chinese spy balloon, just how much potential danger could it carry for the U.S.? On Capitol Hill, President Joe Biden saying he doesn't view the balloon as a major security breach. And the idea that a balloon could traverse, uh, break American airspace is, uh, anyway, it's, it's not a major breach. Biden made the comment during an interview with Noticias Telemundo on Thursday. He called the balloon a violation of international law and noted that once it enters U.S. airspace, Washington can do as it pleases with the craft. The balloon was first detected over Alaska at the end of January. Five days later, Biden ordered the military to shoot it down. After another two days, it was taken down over the Atlantic Ocean. In total, the balloon drifted across the continental U.S. for a week, including over several military bases. Here's what Biden said about the delay. I said I wanted to shot down as soon as possible. And they were worried about the damage that could be done even in a big state like Montana. This thing was gigantic. What happened if it came down and hit a school in the rural area? What happened if it came down? Biden acquiesced to the U.S. military's request to wait two days until it was over water. Republican lawmakers have complained that Biden should have had the balloon downed sooner. And a Democratic lawmaker echoed that message during a hearing on China earlier this week. I love the president, but this move not to bowl down that balloon sends a powerful message to both our enemies and our friends. And they got us on this one. Robert Spaulding, retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General, says China is trying to send a message to the world. They're trying to signal to the world that China is rising and America is weak. Look how weak they are. They can't, they can't even stop this balloon, this Chinese surveillance balloon, from going across the entire country. Rick Fisher, senior fellow of the International Assessment and Strategy Center, says the delay could also impact other fronts. We don't want to give the Chinese Communist Party the impression that it's going to take a week for us to respond to their aggression, be it uh, in Ty on the Taiwan Strait against the Philippines or against uh, South Korea. 
Biden has sought to maintain communications with China and prevent tensions with Beijing from spinning out of control. The FBI is leading efforts to analyze the recovered remains of the balloon. The Bureau has said it doesn't yet have enough information to assess its capabilities. But based on what a State Department source told the Epoch Times, the balloon carried devices able to intercept sensitive communications. Here's NTD's Melina Weiskup with more. A State Department official speaking anonymously to the Epoch Times said that it had multiple antennas to include an array likely capable of collecting and geolocating communications. It was also equipped with solar panels large enough to produce enough power to operate multiple active intelligence collection sensors. The Chinese regime is now accusing the U.S. of engaging in information warfare against China because these new discoveries directly contradict the previous claim by China that this was a weather balloon. Senators did receive a closed-door briefing by White House officials on the issue, and after that briefing, I asked many senators what is their current level, their current assessment of the level of threat that this balloon posed, and we got mixed reactions. Here's a look. Whether there was a threat or not, and I don't believe there was a threat, there wasn't. I also think there was a real threat to civil aviation. If not, why did the FAA issue ground stoppages? There are airplanes in parts of the country that couldn't fly for a defined period of time. This is believed to be just a part of the communist regime's fleet of balloons that has been in operation for several years, traveling across at least 40 countries. Congress is taking action in response to those concerns. The House on Thursday unanimously backed a bill condemning the Chinese spy balloon's incursion into U.S. airspace. On this vote, the yeas are 419, the nays are zero. The chamber labeled the issue a brazen violation of United States sovereignty. The resolution is non-binding, meaning the government is not directed to take any action. Instead, the bill sends the message that Democrats and Republicans are united in condemning China's move. Here's what Congressman Gregory Meeks, the ranking Democrat on the House Foreign Relations Committee, said during the debate. And that we've got to work collectively together to isolate the PRC and its dictatorship for the harm and the spying that it is doing across this globe. China said Friday that it firmly opposed the resolution. Over at the White House, the Biden administration is adding six Chinese entities to an export blacklist each of them with connections to Beijing's suspected surveillance balloon program. Among them are five companies and a research institute. The Commerce Department said it blacklisted them for supporting China's military modernization efforts, specifically aerospace programs run by China's military that involve airships and balloons. The entity list restricts targeted companies from obtaining U.S. tech exports. Both Biden and former President Trump made use of the list, largely to block Beijing from advancing its military through American-made technology. Washington has said it's confident that the manufacturer of last week's spy balloon has a direct relationship with the Chinese military. Questions about the Chinese spy balloon are shifting. Officials now asking exactly who made it. Reports on the subject from China are raising eyebrows. Beijing insists that the downed balloon was a civilian airship for weather research. But the Chinese regime never specified which firm it belonged to. An article found on Chinese internet portal NetEase lists a number of companies, all of them capable of building unmanned airships. These include autonomous aircraft developer Yihang, China's largest weather balloon producer, Zhuzhou Rubber Research and Design Institute, drone manufacturer Dajiang, and wireless tech maker Parrot. Both Yihang and Parrot advertise themselves as civil military integration enterprises, meaning they work closely with the Chinese military. What's more, Dajiang is deemed a military company and has long been sanctioned by the United States. Another article exposed alleged links between the Zhuzhou Rubber Research and Design Institute and the Chinese Army. The institute has reportedly obtained licenses for weapons research and production. It also took orders from the General Armament Department, the agency in charge of arming China's National Army, known as the PLA. The article, titled A Brief History of Wandering Balloons, was quickly scrubbed from the Internet. But according to public information, the Zhuzhou Institute is also a designated supplier to the Joint Staff Department of the PLA. 
Next, here's an update from Tinseltown. The U.S. is taking steps to discourage Hollywood from catering to Beijing. A provision from the National Defense Bill says if studios conform to Beijing censorship, they won't get funding from the Pentagon. Specifically, the rule would apply to studios seeking pre-approval from Beijing for their film or TV projects, especially when a studio alters its content by request of the Communist Party. Deadline Hollywood first reported on the move. In some cases, the Pentagon helps film projects by providing military equipment and technical consultancy. Take the blockbuster Top Gun Maverick. The fleet of F-18 fighter jets that appear in the film were borrowed from the Pentagon. China is one of the world's biggest movie markets. And Hollywood has a long tradition of playing by Beijing's rules. One example of that self-censorship comes from Marvel Studios' blockbuster Doctor Strange. The film invited British Caucasian actress Tilda Swinton to play a Tibetan character, rather than cast a Tibetan actress for the role. That's over fears of losing access to China's market, as Tibet is one of Beijing's most sensitive issues. Back to the provision in the defense bill, it aligns with another measure that Senator Ted Cruz introduced in 2020. Speaking to the China Project, Cruz said the bill's language is designed to counter China's efforts to control what Americans hear, see, and ultimately think. He added that under it, studios that want to work with the U.S. government for military locations or resources will have to keep Beijing off of the set and out of the editing room. Warren Buffett's investment giant is dumping even more of its Chinese holdings. Berkshire Hathaway began selling off shares of Chinese electric vehicle market BYD last August. Since then, it's reduced those holdings by more than a third. Based on a stock exchange filing, Berkshire sold off 4.2 million of the Hong Kong listed shares in exchange for nearly $140 million. The offload happened on February 3rd. It marked the second largest of nine transactions where it cut BYD shares. Berkshire's holdings in the company are now down to 95 million shares, having plummeted from its original investment of 225 million shares in 2008. Estimates suggest the sales have netted the financial giant around $2.6 billion. BYD is based in China's Shanxi province. It topped the list as the globe's maker of largest plug-in hybrids and pure electric vehicles in 2022 and outdid U.S. rival Tesla's growth. Berkshire still holds about a 12 percent stake in BYD. An investment fund that invests in emerging markets, just not China. Details show that human rights concerns plus tensions between the U.S. and China are behind the new investment product. It's called the Emerging Markets X China ETF, backed by Strive Asset Management. Strive is an Ohio-based asset management firm. It's co-founded by Vivek Ramaswamy, who wrote the book Woke Incorporated, and Anson Freerix. The fund covers major emerging markets like India, Taiwan, South Korea, and Saudi Arabia, but excludes China. It launched with $100 million, provided by an institutional investor. For more on the fund, NTD's business host Don Ma spoke to Justin Danhoff, the head of corporate governance at Strive. Here's what he had to say. Thanks for joining me, Justin. So let's just get right into it. The Strive Emerging Markets X China ETF. Why does this ETF exclude China in particular? Yeah, first of all, Don, thanks so much for having me on today. I really appreciate talking about what we're doing here at Strive. Um, what we're focused on with, with this new launch is we think that China risk is investment risk uh, in 2023. Something happened um, in October of 2022 that not a lot of folks in the investment community paid enough attention to from Strive's uh, perspective, and that is Xi Jinping assumed a third term and broke the chain of succession. Essentially, our concern from an investment perspective is that he's now unconstrained. Right. And so there's rising tensions between, you know, Taiwan, for example, rising global tensions that are, you know, percolating out of the CCP. And I'm proud to say from day one, Strive Asset Management has always said we will not operate as an asset manager in China, period, full stop. So excluding China, is this purely a business decision or is there something more than that? 
Yeah, it's a risk risk decision. Absolutely. Um, you know, every investor has to take a look at their their own, you know, risk uh, aversion, um, risk willingness to, to engage in certain investments. And we just think that it's also interesting to note that other asset managers can't say that. Right. What we do at Strive is we act as a voice and a vote for our shareholders. We are a pro fiduciary organization and it's impossible to be a good shareholder, a good steward, a good fiduciary, when you have the boots of the CCP on your neck. And other large asset managers, they have the boots of the CCP on their neck because of their operations in China. And so they don't talk about China risk as much because they operate there, or at all, frankly. Yet these are some of the same asset managers that moralize to Americans and American companies here on issues such as DE&I, and ESG, that's environment, social, and corporate governance, where they try and move social issues through business and through their proxy voting and engagement here in the United States. They say things like climate risk is investment risk, which is why they push on the E of the ESG, the environmental issues. Yet again, they don't talk about the China risk, especially when it comes to some of those very same issues. Um, you know, China's relationship with the environment and building you know, coal-fired power plants all the time. The S of ESG is social. Um, they don't speak out against, you know, the slave labor in the uh, Xinjiang province, for example, yet they moralize here to American companies. Strive doesn't have those conflicts of interest, and that way we can act as a proper steward and a proper fiduciary here in the United States. So to put it very simply, what does this risk translate to for customers? Yeah, um, look, we are part, part of our mission at Strive is to educate. We, we, we like to listen and we also like to educate investors on um, how their capital is being used. And in many ways, what's happening here is there's a promotion of values rather than value. And Strive, our you know, North Star is to promote value. And that's what we're going to do um, with our voice and our vote to engage with you know, the underlying companies uh, in all of our holdings. And so China risk is investment risk in 2023. And part of our mission is to educate the investment community about that. All right. Thank you very much, Justin Denhoff, Strive Asset Management. Pleasure having you on. Thank you. Have a great day. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. How would the U.S. defend against an EMP attack that could kill up to 90 percent of Americans? And how has the recent Chinese spy balloon pushed Communist China's agenda to the forefront? We hear from retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General Robert Spaulding for a breakdown. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.